Assalamu alaikum ji and good evening. Assalamu alaikum ji. Um, if I could ask all of our esteemed guests to just kindly take a seat. Um, Excellency, the former president and prime minister of Sri Lanka, um, Mahinda Raja Paksa is on the way. He'll be entering the hall very, very shortly. I request you to kindly give him a warm applause. I'll let you know as soon as, as he's walking in. Ladies and gentlemen, the former President and Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Excellency Mahinda Rajapaksa. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to kindly take your seats as we will begin the proceedings for this evening. Uh, one quick request to you before we start the proceedings for this evening is to kindly keep your phones on silent. Apne phones please silent pe kar lije. Um, I would request you politely, humbly to not be on your phones um, during the proceedings. If you really need to take one, um, you'd have to go outside of the hallway. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zishan Salahuddin. Uh, I work at a small think tank called the Center for Research and Security Studies. CRSS is one of two organizations, the other one being the Global Village Space um, that has organized this event um, and uh, put the whole thing together for this evening. Uh, GVS is of course a up and coming publication that is dedicated to bringing depth into Pakistani news affairs. Um, I must first and foremost Thank Excellency Mahinda Rajapaksa for sparing his very valuable time for being with us here today. Uh, I must also thank uh, the Chair, uh, Lieutenant General, retired uh, General Asif Yasin Malik for being with us today. Uh, and we also have uh, Ms. Seema Baloch, the former Ambassador to Sri Lanka from Pakistan, um, on, on the dice up here today. Um, before I hand it over to the Chair to uh, go through the proceedings, uh, very quickly I would also like to thank both the teams from GVS and CRSS for working very hard to put this entire thing together. Um, without further ado, uh, General Asif Yasin, who started his very illustrious and storied career back in 1973 with the Pakistan Army. Um, he has also served as the Secretary of Defense for Pakistan. He has had the double post of both the DG, Military Intelligence and Operations, and DG ISI for Pakistan. Um, I can go on and on with his accolades and his accomplishments and achievements, uh, but I think he would like me to stop right there. Um, without further ado, uh, General uh, Yasin Malik to kick off uh, the events for this evening. Thank you, sir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, first of all, I must thank the organizers for giving me this unique pleasure of uh, chairing the session with His, His Excellency President Raja Pakse. Uh, who is a well-known person in not only in Pakistan, but I think all over the globe for doing something uh, which was only read in textbooks. He, in fact, uh, you know, uh, animated the textbooks. And at some places, he challenged the textbooks in the campaign to rid Sri Lanka of terrorism and violence. Uh, Today's session is very important in the sense that we have a large gathering of uh, Sri Lanka lovers here who would like to, you know, uh, relive their association with Sri Lanka and with His Excellency himself. Uh, so it's my proud privilege. And today's session we will start with uh, a small talk by uh, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Seema Baloch who will introduce the uh, subject also and talk something about her experience in Sri, Sri Lanka. Over to Seema. Uh, 
before I say anything, we would also like to welcome former Foreign Minister, Mr. Jill Pires, who's here on the stage with His Excellency. Well, Ayobowan, assalamu alaikum, and good evening. When I arrived in Sri Lanka in the middle of 2010, the beach in Colombo was teeming with people, and the skyline was a riot of colors, of kites and balloons of all shapes and sizes. The hotels were bustling with tourists, and there was a general sense of well-being and optimism in Colombo amongst the local population. This was a sharp contrast to what I had seen during a brief visit in the year 2000. Very few people ventured out of the hotels after dark. There were a few individuals who would walk along the beach, and the sea was eerie in its silence. The transformation was due to His Excellency Mahinda Rajapaksa. He was elected president in 2005. Sri Lanka saw peace after over 29 years of conflict because of his vision and his leadership. Prior to the elections in 2005, he made a commitment to his countrymen that he would bring peace to Sri Lanka. And four years later, he honored that commitment. It was his vision and his leadership, and above all, his political will that made it possible. He remained steadfast in his resolve, and if I may say so, defiant against all opposition. In the aftermath of the defeat of the Tamil Tigers, Sri Lanka on the one hand was going through a healing process of trying to improve its economy, of trying to open routes to the north and the east, which were practically a no-go area because of the control of the LTTE, and of trying to integrate LTTE cadres into the mainstream. On the other hand, the government had to face international pressure by a number of countries and at the Human Rights Council for allegedly taking innocent lives. The Sri Lankan government, with His Excellency at the lead, bravely facing all the charges, was trying to balance it all while moving forward. And this is what the world knows him for. We hope to hear from him today the challenges he faced in achieving what he did and in what followed. But today, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share what I saw and admired in him as a sensitive and caring human being, as a leader of the masses, and as a family man, always dressed as he is now, in white, with the earthy brown shawl depicting Kurakan or millet cultivated by the people of his area, he appeared to be a part of them. I cannot forget 2012, the support that he gave us. When a dengue epidemic broke in Lahore, we were desperate to get a team of professionals to Pakistan. And Sri Lanka, as you may know, has great expertise in both prevention and cure of the disease. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I called His Excellency, asking him for his help. He reassured me that it would be taken care of. The next morning, a Sunday morning, the entire Department of Health was galvanized into action. And by Wednesday, the team of professionals was in Lahore. Due to this timely intervention and support by His Excellency, thousands of lives were saved. And that I was informed of later. That Saturday afternoon, when I disturbed His Excellency, he was watching a rugby match where his, one of his three sons was playing. So whether it was his children or whether it was other commitments in the family, he would forget everything else and be there for them, as he was for his lovely wife, Madam Shiranti Rajapaksa. I attended a number of annual functions of schools she runs for underprivileged children. He would sit there two to three hours looking at little children performing, applauding, appreciating, chatting with their, casually chatting with their siblings and their parents, quite a father figure. I also had the opportunity to see him mingle 
amongst the constitu his own constituents in Hambantota at the soft inauguration of that port. At the end of the formal speeches, he walked to the ship, which had brought a large statue of Lord Buddha as a gift from uh, China. And as you know, the, for Sri Lankans, the Buddha is very sacred. There was no security personnel around him. There were no formalities. There was no protocol. There was no distance between him and the people of that area that had been invited to attend that event. They all walked with him to the ship, young and old, children and elderly. And they stood all around him as if they, along with him, were the special guests of honor. And I thought to myself, truly, he's a leader of the masses. So ladies and gentlemen, how does that fit in with another image created by some critics of this leader who is allegedly responsible for the death of many civilians? Certain facts need to be highlighted here. The Sri Lankan government went into negotiations with the Tamil Tigers 21 times during the three decade long civil war, but with no success. The force on the other side was very well organized, and the leader of the LTT, Velupalai Prabhakaran, was a formidable adversary. His bunker, hidden among the forests of the north, was three stories underground with an arsenal of sophisticated weaponry. Fishing boats donated to the Tamils were turned into suicide boats as they were filled with explosives and rammed into ships. They also had aeroplanes. I have seen all of this. It is not hearsay. And I would request my colleagues who are here, who have served before me and after me, Mr. Bashir Wali Muhammad, um, 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 General Shakil, General Qasim Qureshi, to add anything that I may have missed out and what, whatever they have from their experiences. Having witnessed the remnants of the sophisticated arsenal of the LTTE, which indicated their strength and their expertise in warfare, it seemed that the ultimate action taken by the Sri Lankan government was perhaps, unfortunately, the only route to peace. During my initial exchanges with other diplomats when I arrived in Colombo, I was asked a question. Did the end justify the means? Referring to the last battle that the government had with the LTTE in 2009. This was 2010. And if you recall, ladies and gentlemen, we in Pakistan were facing terrorist attacks all over the country. When I spoke to friends and family back home, there was fear in their voices. They did not know whether to send their children to school. Children did not want their parents to go to work. The apprehension that anything could happen anytime to anyone was unnerving. And it brought home to me in a very poignant way what Sri Lanka must have gone through in its 29 years of conflict. I shared the situation in Pakistan with my colleague who had asked me that question. And my answer was that if the life and future of our children is at stake, yes, the end ju does justify the means. In some cases, we call the loss of human lives collateral damage. And in others, we emphasize it as civilian casualties, depending on who the perpetrator is and which side we are looking at it from. The fact that Mahinda Rajapaksa got elected for a second term in 2010 is evidence that the people of Sri Lanka expressed their gratitude for finally bringing peace to their country, and with it, the many fruits of economic progress. We wish you well, sir, and hope that Sri Lanka will continue to go forward in integrating all its ethnic communities for harmony and peace in your region, in, in your country, and in this region. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador Seema. Now I'll request uh, the guest of honor, President Rajapaksa, to kindly enlighten us with his thoughts on the subject of terrorism in Sri Lanka. of the head table, excellencies, and dear friends. <clears throat> I would like to thank warmly the Global Village Space and Center for Research and Security Studies of Pakistan for their kind invitation to participate in, in the seminar this evening on the theme, Sri Lanka's struggle for peace and its lessons for Pakistan and the region. The topic is one of great importance and relevance for us all. And it is pleasure to share my thoughts with, with you all. The value of this seminar is without doubt enhanced by the input we were privileged to receive from Madam Seema Borch, who has shared with us her memories of Sri Lanka's struggle, is indeed well equipped to do so. But she was there soon after the war was over, that 2010, and there are other high commissioners here, former high commissioners who was in the middle of the battle and uh, one of course he was there was a bomb blast uh, and they were trying to kill him attempt his life even the Pakistan High Commissioner was a target we don't know who did it we suspect that it was LTT so whatever it is I mean we have High Commissioners that who had experience, who had gone through the bill in Sri Lanka. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I recall with appreciation the significant contribution she made High Commissioner made to enrich and deepening the relationship between Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Her remarks on this occasion, if may say so, with respect, were both perceptive and practical. Let me be fair preface my comments today by paying a tribute to the quality and the range of the bilateral relationship between our countries. Ours is a tried and tested friendship in times happy as well as difficult. It is a relationship built on a strong and secure foundation sustained by cultural heritage of which both countries are justly proud. Our outlook on international relations, our economies and social priorities, for the well-being of our people and above all, the spiritual values that guided our conduct as nation have much in common. Sri Lanka is greatly indebted to Pakistan for the steadfast support, both material and moral, that we receive from your country in abandoned measures throughout our struggle with the reason. Equally, in times of peace, we have benefited immensely from the assistance 
extended us by Pakistan in field as diverse as food security, small and medium scale industries and technical expertise in industries like cement and sugar. On our side, it is a matter of deep satisfaction to me, personally of course, that I was able to raise Sri Lanka's voice loud and clear against the attempt that was made at a Commonwealth summit to expel Pakistan from organization on account of domestic, domestic issues. We have stood by each other throughout the thick and thin in every human rights commission when they, Pakistan came to our school. They voted results. They supported us openly in the human rights commissions. Please. May I now turn to the topic at hand and express in my spirit of humility some of my perceptions about the lessons to all of us from Sri Lanka's long and from then on my total commitment was to the eradication of terrorism for the protection of the condition of success a properly conceived and systematically coordinated strategy this consists of a variety of components on a modest economy such as ours. But our people did not grudge the sacrifice that had to be made to serve, secure dignity and liberty for themselves and for generations to come. It is also a matter of the greatest importance to reflect which care and discrimination on the personnel to whom vital responsibilities are to be entrusted. The military leadership must enjoy the complete confidence of the rank and file. They must be in close and regular touch with the leaders of the government without this absolute empathy and understanding success is not possible. This is in the final analysis is a matter of conviction. Those who bear arms on behalf of their people must believe in heart and spirit without any reservation in the justice of their cause. The thought was uppermost in my mind throughout those challenging times that nothing is as important as to we in the public away from the terrorists. The struggle against terrorism is just as vital for every segment of society. No distinction can be made among the singular Tamil and Muslim Muslims. It is not often realized abroad that the terrorists slaughtered as many Tamil leaders and Tamil people as they did singular leaders and singular people. So, not only singles, they kill, they kill Tamils, their own people, their own leaders, they kill uh, our foreign minister, Khadra Gama, well-known figure among you all, and he was killed. I mean, anyone who was opposed and moderate, they kill, they kill Muslims, they kill Sinhalese. I believe in no social context can terrorism prevail without the support and cooperation of the community in which they live. A necessary ingredient of a successful strategy then is a level of public identification 
that effectively prevents the terrorists from gaining the sympathy and support, direct and indirect, of a large section of the people. This involves the management of the economy in such a way as to strike a significant balance among investment, development and welfare. It is legitimately satisfying to reflect that while making ample provision for the required military expenditure, such matters as the fertilizer subsidy for farmers, the provision for boats and fishing gears, for the fishing community, free school books and uniform for school children and regular emoluments and pensions for the public servant were constantly addressed to forestall any from public unrest. So we didn't want a public unrest. So therefore we had to keep them happy, keep them calm and quiet. And they did it. They believed in us. They trust us when we said we will eradicate terrorism. Support us. They support us. The unbroken identification of public sentiment with the war was a source of great strength to me. All of this required visible indication of public endorsement. This is why in the spirit of many, in spite of many obstacles, and problems, I insisted on holding elections at all levels, parliamentary, provincial council, and the local authorities at the proper time and indeed earlier than the time prescribed by law. And finally, I had to go home because of that. I had two more years before I <laughs> kept elections. In 2015, I would have gone till 2017, so, but I, but now what I can see is we are, our local government election due, delayed for two years now, nearly two years. They have not kept the elections. So we are waiting for it. In this way, the crucial requirement of public Accountability was fully satisfied the way we handled it. However, I also go in mind that the successful accomplishment of our objective in the case of a country such as mine depends, mine depends as much on external as on internal factors. On numerous occasions, both within and outside Sri Lanka, I have candidly reiterated that victory over the forces of terror would have been extremely difficult to achieve without the vigorous support we received from friendly nations. I express once again my deep gratitude for this, especially to you, your government, people of Pakistan. Regrettably, however, there were also unfounded and prejudiced criticism which grew not out of, of an objective inquiry into the truth, but simply reflected the power and influence of a section of the diaspora over their respective governments. Human rights discourse was the launching pad of these ask criticism. But strangely enough, we see today these same critics making their own arguments stand on their head when terrorist atrocities visit them on their own doorsteps. Now see, we must forget about human rights now. We, we can't talk about human rights now. Because people's lives 
are much important. So this is what they are saying now. A few days ago, we even saw a statement that suspension of human rights is appropriate in light of the priority which must be given to the suppression of the most most horrendous acts of terror. Irony of this situation cannot be lost on the audience that I am addressing this evening here in the Islamabad. It was never our practice to veer from one extreme to the other. It is not a question of a straightforward choice between security and freedom. Both have to be catered for in the context of a specific situation and priorities have to be identified in a realistic way. But I have to stress that at no time was I prepared to sacrifice the destiny of my people at the altar of an insincere and self-serving appeal to human rights. If we are to win the global fight against terror, we must all use the same vocabulary on, and apply the same standards consistently. There are no tutors or students in this field of human experience. We are all fellow sufferers at the hands of terrorism in an entirely negative sense. Entirely negative sense, terrorism is a leveler of humankind. Nations large and small and with varying degrees of economic strength and influence on the world stage are all its victims. There is no room for hypocrisy or double dealing. In conclusion, I want to say there is much we can learn from the experience of one another. There is no need to leave it in the wheel. But at the same time, if action is to be productive, we have to adapt positive experiences else we are to suit the circumstances of our own situation. This is why the exchange of ideas and perspective of the kind we engage in this evening is so fruitful and timely. I have enjoyed our discussions and I thank you once again for the opportunity of participating in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It was very, very enlightening, and uh, I think coming from you, it had all the weight that it requires to affect the audience here. Now I'll request uh, the audience to uh, for a question and answer session. Uh, what I would request is that please keep the question short or the comment short and introduce yourself uh, before you uh, ask the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, first, it's a pleasure to see the President for a second time again. And I visited your beautiful country in 71, where I had the honor of having an audience for one hour with the Chief Monk at that time. My question is that uh, General Asaf Yassin Malik had the forefront of the fight against terrorism. And six and a half years ago, he allowed us to work in Fatah, and particularly in North Waziristan, which was the hub of terrorism at that time. And what we did was we went there, and we are still working there, and helped the local people. We looked after the problems they had, clean water, electricity, food. And that, I think, Mr. President, is probably the most important aspect in the fight against terrorism, that get, you get the locals involved with you. 
and have them on your side. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, uh, Raza Khan from PTU World, Special Correspondent. Uh, this is the only English channel in Pakistan. I'm a great uh, fan of uh, the way you've uh, destroyed uh, the manners of terrorism in your country. And all Pakistanis are proud of the fact uh, you've talked about the Sri Lankan-Pakistani friendship. Uh, I would just like to ask you how and uh, uh, were you able to counter the so-called human rights lobby, be that in your country or in the West, which kept on criticizing you? And you launched that final decisive operation and you literally crushed LTT in those days. Because we are in the battle against uh, TTP and other terrorists and uh, Pakistan has to face them for the last 17 years or so. So what lessons, specific lessons can you give us as far as tackling this so-called human rights lobbies pressure which keeps us from crushing the terrorists? It has not finished because the Western countries are making the, the Human Rights Commission. They are bringing various resolutions and they want to, even the present government, because of, because of political issues, that they have agreed to some of the proposals that the Americans and the British uh, introduced to the commission. So we are facing it. They have postponed it for two years now. So we are still facing the issues. Okay. So I think the foreign minister, will, former foreign minister, will elaborate. You see, the basic problem we faced was that the discussion did not proceed on the ground of principles of what is right, what is equitable. But the dominant considerations were political considerations. There were resolutions passed against Sri Lanka in the Human Rights Council in three consecutive years, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Now, if you look at the composition of the Human Rights Council, see, the European Union has a dominant presence in the Human Rights Council. And uh, it is customary for all the countries of the European Union to come to a common decision that is really made in Brussels. And uh, we had as many as 12 countries of the European Union who had votes in the Human Rights Council. So as foreign minister on the president's direction, I used to visit these foreign capitals, speak to their foreign ministers. But I would speak to them and come back home. Sri Lanka, being a small country with modest resources, cannot maintain embassies in countries all over the world. But the, those who were pitted against us had the advantage of a permanent presence in those capitals, very considerable influence that they could wield with decision-making in those governments. And at the end of the day, the decision hinged very much on political considerations. So this is a problem that we, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of uh, right and wrong. It is, it is a question of sheer physical, economic, and military strength. Uh, my name is Faisal Raza Khan. I am a uh, senior correspondent from 92 News. Uh, my question is particularly uh, to the former president, Mr. Mahindra Raja Paksa. Sir, um, how do you see the recent surge uh, in terrorist activity, especially Daesh and all of the factions within the region in South Asia particularly, uh, in the backdrop of uh, different sort of economic developments which are enhancing within the region, especially when we are talking about uh, CPAC, uh, the CARIC program, the Eurasian Union, and uh, especially the developments which are going on into the 
uh, island country Sri Lanka, your country. So how do you see uh, this aspect because now uh, this so-called human rights violations type of things, the resolutions in the, within the human rights councils and uh, into the European Parliament particularly, and then afterwards the surge in terrorist activities within the region seems that uh, this is another way to block the economic uh, progress within the region, especially the countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Please. Yes. The, what you said was that the Western countries want to block us, our development in this region. And uh, not only that, they are keeping this as a weapon, human right as a weapon to whip us. Anyone who is against them, they will use this. If they are with them, with the West, definitely they will help you. Whether it is Pakistan or Sri Lanka or Sri Lankan government or many other countries in the region and uh, what they do is they want to control us and they are using this human right as a shield. I think uh, we can elaborate with that. Yes, uh, Sri Lanka's own experience was that we had um, various economic sanctions of different kinds applied against us simply because the West did not approve of what we were doing. For example, the GSP plus facility was taken away from Sri Lanka. That was an example of a flagrant abuse of a trade treaty. I mean, GSP plus, after all, is, is a treaty with regard to trade, nothing to do with politics. But the decision to take it away from Sri Lanka was entirely determined by political considerations. They were contemplating other measures, which were even more far-reaching. And I think one of the elements of the answer to your question is that polarization is allowed to take place at a time when a problem is capable of being sorted out by discussion, by compromise, not addressed. But it reaches alarming proportions, uh, at which point uh, nothing rational uh, is uh, capable of being done. I think one other point uh, needs to be made. You know, at the end of the day, in all our countries, as President Rajpaksa emphasized in his remarks, the armed forces must have total confidence. Now, what is happening in Sri Lanka from that point of view, I think is very distressing. Now, these are people who sacrifice their own lives to bring peace and tranquility to our troubled island. What's happening now? The United Nations is insisting that new laws be created. Not that they be tried under the existing laws, not the laws that operated at the time the war took place, but new laws to be enacted and given retrospective operation. Laws which they could not possibly have known of at the time they fought this dangerous war. We have nothing against the rule of law being applied. Members of the armed forces, like all of us, are subject to the rule of law. If they have done wrong, they must be punished. But they must be tried by regular courts in keeping with the laws that govern all of us. What is now proposed are special judicial tribunals, ad hoc tribunals established for this purpose only. Now, you know, in, in our region as a whole, if you, if you go on like that, what is the inevitable result? The armed forces are certainly not going to put their head on the block if they are called upon to deal with similar situations in the future. I think that 
is going to be a very significant disincentive. They, they, they would think very hard. Twice. Yes, they, they, they would think twice, maybe three times, ten times. Because why should they place themselves in jeopardy when they have nothing personal to gain? They are engaging in this entirely for the well-being of their nation. And if this is the way they are going to be treated ex post facto, after they have accomplished their objective, then their <coughs> motivation, their motivation in situations of that kind in the future is certainly going to be affected. Uh, sir, my question related to South Asian uh, South uh, Association of uh, Regional Cooperation. They, uh, since uh, long, uh, SARC is not uh, active. And last uh, time, uh, the SARC summits also not held. And Sri Lanka, uh, present government of Sri Lanka also sided with India. Why do you now suggest the uh, uh, improvement, the relations between the Pakistan and Sri Lanka is also not uh, as in your time? And what do you suggest for the betterment of the, this region that the uh, Pakistan's and Indian relations can be better and Sri Lanka and Pakistan relation can be also boosted? Your suggestions. I think we lost a window of opportunity to settle most of the problems that we had in the region. Because SAP, though our government issued a statement supporting the Indian, but the joint opposition made very clear that we are, we, we said that the SAC must be held, they must go to Islamabad and to have it. Because that would have been a good uh, forum to start with. We have to have a dialogue. Because whatever the UN or any other Commonwealth or UN, you won't be able to discuss the regional matters like this. It is very personal when it goes there. You know, the way that the SAC uh, members meet, they have the opportunity of meeting each other and discuss. I can remember uh, in the Nepal, when we had the SAC, they had the, the opportunity of discussion have a dialogue with each other for a long, there was one or two hours we were together, I think more than two hours. So we had that opportunity of meeting each other and discuss about what is happening in your own country and the issues that they can raise. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, correct, uh, I think uh, the Pakistani Prime Minister and Indian Prime Minister had a discussion there for a long time, an informal way. So the informal discussions is very important. So this was an opportunity, so, but we lost it. Everyone lost it, the region lost it, I would say, that not only the two countries that involved, but the region lost that opportunity. Yeah, I think, I, no, the, Throughout the period of the President's government, we emphasize regional identity, regional identity, regional values, our heritage, our culture, our cherished convictions. And that is why we are very unhappy about the attitude that the present government of Sri Lanka is taking to SARC, denigrating SARC, looking down on the non-aligned movement, looking upon it as something obsolete. That is not the case. We, we don't agree with that at all. I think SARC needs to be revitalized. New energy has to be breathed into SARC. And President Rajbaksa's policy all along was that uh, SARC should not concentrate exclusively on political issues because there are very difficult and perhaps in insurmountable problems in that area. Let's also look at the economic side of things, the cultural side of things, contacts among professionals, universities, and so on. 
So this way, I think, I think we can make something of SARC, and it can certainly make a very constructive contribution to the maintenance of peace and stability in this region and the defeat of terrorism. Thank you, Your Excellency, and thank you, Mr. President. Well, in the context of uh, SARC and regional cooperation, how would Sri Lanka view if, uh, let's say, Pakistan or some other countries uh, invite China to join SARC? If India can be a member of uh, SCO, and India doesn't share borders with uh, any SEO country except China. China is sharing borders or has common borders with four members of SARC. Don't you think that the expansion of SARC and inclusion of China uh, would create an element of balance at SARC and also give it new dynamism? Thank you. China is, uh, I think, uh, belongs to the so, uh, different region, if I'm not mistaken. China is South Asian. South Asian. No, not, is South Asian. Sa 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 is South Asian, and China is out of South Asian, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, is it? That is the position. Sorry? Are, are you sure? As relation to SCO, India is not part of Central Asia. Or ah, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, China is at the moment an observer. So even that was given very recently. 2004. That 2004. At the moment, uh, there, are, there are observers. And in future, I think, I don't mind it. Because Sri Lanka won't mind it. So we love it because they are the people who can offer to give us. <laughs> that is, you know, to develop the country. I mean, we don't mind. But uh, unfortunately, when India says no or Pakistan says no, we can't move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. You know this uh, insurgency, counterinsurgency in Sri Lanka for almost three decades has been a subject of great interest to the students of uh, this particular subject, how insurgencies are, how they are fought. And you made some very, very interesting points in them. I especially enjoyed your remark on how we all want to talk about the sound principles of counterinsurgency, avoid collateral damage, use military only for that purpose, and so on and so forth, till the whole thing hits you yourself on the doorsteps. And after that, we are not particularly you know, keen about the orchestrated use of, of various means at the disposal of nation. We want a high hammer to take care of that. Now, that is universal. That happens. In your case, you over the last over three decades, you probably have used so many of different means till you came to a particular uh, stage where the whole thing had to be finished, perhaps for the military means. The second point was about uh, military being the last resort, military being used only for a particular calibrated reason. Now, point is uh, that now that the whole thing was taken care of ultimately by a uh, means of force. The bigger challenge that we all know still had to be taken care of. How do you bring the estranged community back in the mainstream? After all, these are always your own people. And so 
you do not want to burn your bridges with them, they are also, you know, a little peeved off. What was your vision that the Ambassador talked about of bringing them back, reconciling them so that they do become, you know, the normal parts of your citizen of your country? The day after the war, also war, I mean, the, the day that most of the people came to government control area, ultimately everybody came, other than the people who died in the war, like Prabhakaran and them. So even Prabhakaran's father, mother, uncles, and everybody was in the government control areas, in the camps. We looked after them. We feed them, fed them. We, when they want medical assistance, we took them to the hospitals. We look after them, everybody. The biggest task was to demine the area first. We had to demine the whole area because it was mined, land mines so everywhere. So we demined the place. When I asked one of the volunteers from Norway, uh, he said that we will take about 10 years to do this or 14 years. Then I had to get down the army and gave that task to the army. Got machineries and told the army, you finish this. And they, within one year, not more than one, in one less, ten, less, days. 10 months, they cleared the place. And we immediately, what we did was to give them all the facilities, infrastructure, the roads, the electricity, water, schools, then the hospitals, everything was built. I pumped money to them. And there were other, you know, I think uh, he will tell you about that. At the cabinet meeting we had, there was an argument, so I don't want to tell that. But we pumped money there and managed to develop everything. Then we resettled them, some of them. And the people, about 12,000 carders, about 2,500, we rehabilitated them. Some, were, some went through the whole course of six months. Then others went for three months. And, but we said, send them, release them to the society. Let the society rehabilitate them. Because at that time I knew the society was with me. So we released them. We released about 12,500 at once. And they went there. And I don't think anybody, anyone who had gone through that rehabilitation program, will take any weapons hereafter. They will not do that. That um, I took a risk. Actually, I took a risk. But fortunately, I mean, I was correct at that time. And uh, now, the, but we gave all these things, but we couldn't, we didn't do politics in that area. That was the mistake that we did. We thought we must give everything Possible, they were economically, we made them uh, rich, strong. strong, but but unfortunately, I don't, our political party, I know not only myself, but the coalition government. So I requested some of the parties to go there and start work, but unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, that was the mistake we did, not winning over the, them politically. But in otherwise, I think we we gave them everything possible. And because of the diaspora and the political leaders, you know, political leaders generally, they won't allow them to. They want them on their side for their purposes. They are not worried about the country or the people. They are worried about themselves only. So this is what happened in Sri Lanka. We strongly believe that um, 
true reconciliation cannot be achieved in an, in an atmosphere that is pervaded by acute economic hardship. If there is dire poverty and people are very unhappy with their lot in life, that is not a context in which reconciliation is capable of being achieved. So President Rajapaksa dealt with it sequentially. There was a sharp uh, emphasis on infrastructure, roads, railways, and so on. Livelihoods, employment, the creation of new jobs, factories being opened in those areas, the apparel industry going there, hospitals, schools, all of that. Then the matter that he referred to was uh, a discussion at a cabinet meeting where one of my colleagues pointed the, asked the president, why are you doing this? Our resources are scarce. You're spending all of these resources, or a very large part of these resources, on the northern province. But you cannot expect a political benefit out of it. Whatever you do, these people are not going to vote for you. Why don't you use even a fraction of that uh, to develop other areas which are also in need of these resources and the political harvest will be much richer. You will gain much more. But his answer was, let us for once do what is right rather than what is politically expedient. These are the people who have suffered the most because of the ravages of war. So I'm not interested in votes or political benefits for myself. We will do the right thing. So we did that. And unfortunately, before the process could reach its culmination, the change of government occurred. But we had laid the foundation for a prosperous economy. The economy of the North was growing three times as fast. Three times. No? Three yes, times. about 24 three. percent. When yeah. the country's economy was about eight. Yeah, the rate of, yeah, the rate of growth there was 24 percent. Then the national, uh, the improvement GDP. nationally was about eight percent. So that was the preference that we gave for good reasons. Uh, to the needs of the Tamil people. Um, Mr. President, thank you for coming here and for sharing your experience with us. It's really uh, an honor for us. Uh, I am Dr. Najma Sadiq. I am from Nest University. Uh, from Department of Mass Communication. Uh, I have a question related to academia from you, like uh, the conflict or the rehabilitation process, like what, how do you rate the role that academia in Sri Lanka has played in creating a kind of nationalistic discourse to uh, uh, contribute in de-escalation process or rehabilitation and healing process? the academia inside Sri Lanka, or the discourse that is being created by the academia outside Sri Lanka, because most of the time, whatever uh, we as an academician or outside uh, from Sri Lanka are looking at uh, what is happening in Sri Lanka is from the academic discourse if we really want to look for an informed discussion. So as a Sri Lankan president, how do you evaluate? Because you are within that country, you have seen everything on your own. So the way they are representing these things, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, and what uh, and the cha and the discourse that is being uh, created by academia? What kind of challenges that have created for you for countering the extremism, or what are the opportunities that this uh, academic discourse has created for you? Thank you very much. <coughs> best person to answer that is my foreign minister and he is a vice chancellor of a university. <laughs> so he will, I think, answer that. And because we have mixed all, I mean, say in Jaffna, not only the Tamils students, there are Sinhali students, there are Muslim students. In the eastern province, there are Muslims, Tamils and Sinhalese. In Colombo, we have Tamils, we have Muslims, we have Sinhalese. Even in Peradeniya, the, the oldest university, Peradeniya in Kandy, we have mixed it. So it all depends on the marks that they got. And we mixed it them. Because, because this, 
we, we never gave a university because he is, this belongs to Jafra and for Tamils or the Muslims or the Sinhalese. So we, I think uh, he will elaborate it because... At the end of the day, what is most important is attitude. And attitudes are formed when people are young. Now, universities in our country and, and yours, anywhere in the world, provide a very valuable opportunity for people from different cultural backgrounds, people speaking different languages, to get together. Now, in our universities, you see uh, a Tamil child will, will have the opportunity of realizing that his hopes, his aspirations, are no different from the hopes and aspirations of a single child. What's the difference? They all want a good job, they want a home, they want to marry, have children, prosper in their community. So these kind of cut right across the spectrum. Doesn't matter whether you are singular or Muslim or Tamil. And in, in a university you have that kind of environment. They go to lectures, they, there, are, there are cultural lives, there are sports activities. They, they get to know each other. Now to start with, there is a wall of reserve, wall of reserve. But when they live together for three years or four years, they begin to realize that what they share in common is very much more than the things that divide and separate them. I think that is the principal role of academia and universities in promoting the kinds of attitudes that will be helpful in finding a durable and lasting solution to this problem. Mr. Uh, Shams, the Deputy Head of Mission in Afghanistan. Excellency, it's an honor uh, to hear to your experiences. And we heard about your successes. We read about your successes. And it gave us hope that one day uh, peace is possible. One day. And uh, Afghanistan, we will also experience peaceful. Uh, our case is somehow similar to uh, Excellency, uh, your problem, uh, but now totally uh, not uh, similar. My government launched the reconciliation process, the peace process, uh, almost 10 years back. But it's very unfortunate that to date uh, it has been repeatedly rejected uh, by the insurgents and by the opponents. Uh, with the recent uh, brutal attacks and the violent attacks in Afghanistan, there is a debate coming from people that we should take stern action against the insurgents. For example, there are suggestions that execute all their prisoners and take stern actions. If you are asked, Excellency, what do you suggest to, to our government that uh, shall we proceed with the reconciliation process? Shall we take more effective military action? Thank you so much. It's a combination. You try, ultimately you have to go back to that, to military action. But not the people who are in remand, <laughs> in your custody. <laughs> you have to protect them, of course, and try to rehabilitate them. But certainly, you have to try to negotiate them with them. But if it fails, then there is no other option other than military action. So, but whatever it is, if those terrorists are getting any any assistance from a powerful countries, then of course the story is different. Then we'll have to negotiate with the countries first <laughs> before they... Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Excellency, I'm a professor at the Kadi Azim University. You very rightly pointed out that the terrorists always receive support within this society and that's why they survive. But we have also noticed even in the Sri Lanka case, that the terrorists always get support from external sites, material, weapons, money. 
these kind of things are very important for the terrorists to survive, which we say political sport or external sport. What is your experience in this case? How you tackle that sport? Because without cutting that supply chain, it's too difficult to combat the meanness of terrorism. And that is very important for us as well. Thank you, sir. I think we got the information from most of the countries about the motherships, because the LTT had a, a fleet of ships, I would say, where the uh, transport uh, weapons, weapons to other groups, other countries, then uh, narcotics, they were in that business. So they had a, they had a mothership that was, you know, uh, what do you call this? Uh, parked in the, in the middle of the sea, anchored, anchored in, in the middle of the sea. So we got the information from a friendly country, and with that, our navy went there with the air force, and we destroyed that mothership. So we destroyed about 11 ships in the mid of sea. So with that, I think the supply was cut. And uh, the diaspora, actually they, are, they were collecting money from the, by, by all this, you know, by the ships by ships, by transporting weapons and narcotics, that all that money went to that fund, uh, supplying weapons to the terrorists. So when we destroy the ships, the transport, then it all automatically, we were, you know, they were weakened. We, we, we had discussions with diaspora, too, about Tamil diaspora. Excellency, there are two aspects which I think the international community has not recognized the strength of the Sri Lankan society. First is that despite this vast bloodshed and hot turmoil over a long stretch of time, there has been a continuous chain of the constitutional process. All decisions were taken by the people and their representatives sitting in parliament. There has been no interruption. Now, while they talk of human rights and what the laws should be and what kind of laws, there is no recognition of the strength, the social cohesion, and the, cost, uh, and, and the uh, shall we say, the continuity of the constitutional process, which I think is something that all other societies, especially in this region, uh, should really for which we have special tribute. You mentioned uh, the, the uh, people who are in turmoil killing their own people, and you mentioned Lakshman Kader Gama, who was a colleague of mine, we together we debated the Oxford Union, and that also reminds me of Lalith Atulot Mudli, who were earlier on the victim of the same. So it's a very difficult situation, difficult to describe and compress, but you have succeeded. And I thought, building on what uh, the professor just asked you about the external factors, and you were able to narrow down on a ship and you were able to prevent uh, the further flows. Now, that's remarkable, and I hope, I hope that is an end to the external factors, which is a big question that uh, people continue to ask. The second is, the, after this uh, series decisive military uh, dominance, the bringing those communities back to where they were, from where they were uprooted, and trying to rehabilitate them and to pick up the relationships which are disrupted, uh, that is a second factor about which you would like to know uh, how you went about this and how successful you have been. But I must say that uh, your analysis and your reading and above all your presentation is absolutely super. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, I think as you said, the West is not recognizing what I did. 
so I, I, I'm not worried about it because still my people are at least in the region. If our friends are thinking that I did the correct thing, that's all. Uh, as soon as we finish the war, I mean, as I said, we developed the infrastructure, schools, the people didn't, you know, then whatever possible, I mean, they had the opportunity of study, the students, we looked after the children, and that was the important thing. And we allowed them to go back to the universities, back to the colleges, where they couldn't go when there was a war going on. Because LTT recruited all the youngsters, like children. I would say they had about 15,000 uh, or 5,000, 5,000, 5, about 5,000 carders, child soldiers, 13 years, 14 years, 15 years, like that. So we managed to get them back and uh, send them to schools. So by doing that, I think the, we had that, you know, the people, whether it is politically, they were against it, us, but they were happy in their own. And they are the, some of the students are the best students. In every, every, or I, I would say, in advanced level or O level, they get the best results. So at the university, they are doing very well. So this is what we have, I mean, achieved. These are achievements, I would say, that no one talks about. But at the moment, I, even today, the fundraisings are going on, in, um, especially in the Western countries. And uh, I don't know whether they, they are trying another gimmick, but the fundraisings are going on, and the governments know about it. That I am sure of. Last question, please. Hello, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Fahad. I'm a businessman in Islamabad and vice president of Youth Thinkers Society. Uh, whether it's TTP or LTT in your case, they have some so-called so ideology behind them, which they portray to recruit the, the youth among for them. How uh, good or what path did Sri Lanka take in creating a counter argument or counter ideology um, in getting rid of LTT? Moreover, there is always a small faction of the government machinery, the corrupt faction, which fuels uh, to the motives of such uh, organizations. How were you able to counter those corrupt small factions of, among your government machinery? Thank you very much. I don't think they had any ideology. So yeah, they tried to get them. They said one of one from the family, one member from the family must join the LTT. Otherwise, all of them would have been, you know, killed. So they had to send whether they like it or not. I mean, there was so much, so many letters that they had written by these people, and it's the literature, I would say. And unfortunately, they have not, you know, we have not collected it properly. It was compulsion to join the forces. I mean, at the LTT, as LTT carders. So they, they, are, they want a separate state. They want to divide the country. That's all. And if they didn't, they killed their own people. And there were several groups. I would say one of the ministers who was with us, he also, he was a former LTT. The number two of the LTT, number two of the LTT, after Prabhakar, uh, Karuna, in the eastern province, he was the military man. We managed to get him to our side. And he was a minister in our cabinet. So we we tried everything possible. And there was so uh, 
not only him, I mean, the chief minister of the eastern province was a Tamil and a LTT uh, leader in that area. He was fighting at that time and we managed to get him to our side because they knew that with Prabhakaran that he is a, he, a brutal killer. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, we have a lot of uh, eager hands uh, for asking questions, but I think uh, we are ap uh, approaching the critical hour of Aftar, and uh, many of us would like to, you know, uh, break it there fast. But uh, I'm too small a person to speak after you, but the protocol requires that I say a few words for which I was made to sit here, apart from, uh, uh, um, you know, chairing the questions, etc. My experience in Sri Lanka was, first time I went to Sri Lanka was in 2009, and uh, I remember Colombo, uh, I think at every, if not at every step, every, at every second step, there was a police or a military check post. Uh, we were, uh, you know, in spite of uh, being in an embassy car, we were asked to, you know, uh, get searched and all that. All the hotels, they were in a state of uh, sort of uh, uh, encirclement by security, barbed wire, concertinas and so on. And then after that I went in 2012. In this three years span I could see the sea change in Colombo itself and I had the pleasure of driving uh, to Kandy also. So in the way also we saw the transformation of Sri Lanka from a war-torn society trying to rise from the uh, ashes, so to say. And uh, I was very impressed uh, with the way the Sri Lankan nation had come up, but then that nation had a leadership, the leadership of President Rajapaksa, who was leading that nation in its pursuit. Uh, I would call it, it was a rebirth of Sri Lanka. After 30 years of turmoil, it was rejuvenated and reborn as a nation. And today we see it rising. Pakistan has had the unique privilege of playing a pivotal role in the Sri Lankan drive to liberate from terrorism. And most importantly, this role was not restricted to the military. It was across the board. The people of Pakistan were standing with the people of Sri Lanka. That was the strength of relationship between Pakistan and Sri Lanka for which we as Pakistanis feel very proud uh, to be, have been part of your struggle in getting rid of the menace of terrorism. Uh, there is one commonality which somebody also talked was foreign interference. And luckily the interference was from one country. In Pakistan also there is a proxy war going on. And it's the same country which was trying to destabilize Sri Lanka for its ulterior motive. And uh, the Sri Lankans gave a bloody face to them. And they had no place to hide their face when Sri Lanka emerged successful after that terrorism campaign which was being sponsored from abroad. Uh, Pakistan's cooperation was superb during the conflict period, but I'm afraid it did not stay put post-conflict. In my opinion, that was the time that we could have also moved along with Sri Lanka, helped it and learned from it how to get out of a conflict and post-conflict situation which is critical. Pakistan is now on the verge of that state of post-conflict, uh, you know, environment. That is where we have to learn from Sri Lanka and from leaders like President Rajapaksa. The, uh, the challenge in that struggle was to have a visionary leadership. And I think His Excellency provided that visionary leadership to see behind the walls, to see across the oceans, and then to have a policy which was encompassing, wholesome and encompassing both during the war and post-war. Today, Sri Lanka is well on its way to socio-economic development 
and its recovery is exemplary. In fact, it is a model for other countries fighting terrorism, which are many today in the world. As far as the issue of human rights is concerned, again, I think we are on a similar platform. Sri Lanka has not yet get, gotten out of that bogey of human rights violations. Pakistan has also been facing it. I myself, as Commander 11 Corps, was you know, questioned and asked, and one of the countries refused me a visa also for being Commander 11 Corps. You know, that's <coughs> very funny. And it's a big bogey. And they do not look at what the terrorists are doing. 50,000 to 70,000 people have been killed in Pakistan. Isn't that human rights violation? Thousands of people were killed in Sri Lanka brutally. Wasn't that human rights violation? So it's a selective application of our international law for countries whom the world doesn't like or want to, you know, uh, meet or not allow them. At the end, let me say, President Rajapaksa created an ideal combination of political will, the national resolve, and the military power through the, his statesmanship, political acumen, and leadership qualities. This was what I call rebirth of Sri Lanka, the combination of these things. No single factor could have brought Sri Lanka out of that turmoil. All these factors led them. Sir, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the organizers for enlightening us with your uh, uh, ideas based on your personal experience, hands-on experience. I think there is no person today in, this, uh, in the uh, contemporary times who can walk a nation through turmoil into peace like you. So we wish you health, happiness, and uh, may Sri Lanka have more leaders like you to rise. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Chair, for this evening's um, uh, proceedings. Uh, please join us for Iftar. Uh, we have a lot of uh, high-profile guests with us, uh, some former diplomats and some current diplomats. We're going to do a quick photo session uh, with the President, if you would allow it, uh, right at the stage. Um, and my colleague in the back, Mirvais, Mirvais, uh, is going to call you up onto the stage um, one by one to take, take those pictures. Thank you. Uh, if I could ask all, 
If I could ask all former ambassadors to kindly step up for the first picture of the president, all former ambassadors and former foreign secretaries. Former ambassadors and former foreign secretaries to kindly step to the front, please, so we can take a quick picture with you. Thank you. 